Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm AJ Rodriguez, and I'm the chairman of the Texas Association of Business this year, and I'm also vice president of external affairs for Zachary Group. It really is my honor to be here. And before we move on, I would like to first recognize our Congressman Will Hurd, who represents our home district in San Antonio. So can you please stand just quickly be recognized? We're glad to have you, Congressman. Appreciate all your leadership on immigration reform, DACA, and a number of other issues. Thank you for all your bipartisan work in Congress. It's an honor to welcome all of you to today's luncheon for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition uh, for a critical and timely conversation today about the global opportunities our country is facing and how America's role in the world matters more than ever to our local communities. And that really is the purpose of our our, our discussion and our partnership that the Tech Association of Business has with the USGLC. The coalition is an important partner to us as, as is the US Chamber and a number of other associations that we have. I know Monique Theory is in the audience today representing the US Chamber. And so we're glad to form those kinds of partnerships. Uh, and they have such an imp impressive group of leaders that are part of the USGLC. So many of you that are here are part of their advisory committee as well. And I'd like to recognize even though he's not here today our former mayor of San Antonio, Henry Cisneros, who is also our former HUD secretary, who so many years ago forged uh, the partnership and the sister city relationship with Kumamoto Japan uh, that then turned out to help in terms of those economic development trade missions and, and that, that relationship that he created uh, helped to forge and bring to fruition the Toyota manufacturing plant here to San Antonio. And if it wasn't for those seeds that were planted early on, that may not have happened. We have Fernando Reyes here, the former chair of the Hispanic Chamber, who's one of their tier one suppliers. Thank you, Fernando, for your, for your partnership, your engagement here as well. So there's so many advisory board members that are part of this coalition that are engaged with the USGLC, and they're really from both sides of the aisle. Uh, they're pillars of our community, uh, both business community, the faith communities that we have, they're humanitarians, they're part of our civic officials, they're, all, they're several of our military veterans, and like I said, they're from both sides. It's a nonpartisan organization. And that just speaks a lot to what the mission of the coalition is working to create, in, in my estimation. And so, uh, as a member of the San Antonio business community, uh, we know that large and small businesses and local economies are significantly linked to the economic currents of the world. And just to give you a few facts, 95% of the consumers live outside of our borders. And today's fastest growing markets are in the developing world. So one in five American jobs are tied to international trade and one third of all manufacturing jobs in the US are directly tied to our exports. So in order to advance those American interests that we have in these markets, we rely on the strategic investments that we make both the national level, the state level, and the local level uh, on economic development and diplomacy. They're important to uh, creating those, those new relationships that we have and open new markets really for our country's exports. And just this morning, I saw a social media post of a local San Antonio delegation who is currently in Spain and they are drumming a business right now for San Antonio and hopefully playing the kinds of seeds that Henry did in Japan you know, 30 years ago along with the city leaders at that time to make that happen for our Spanish companies uh, here in San Antonio and in Texas which are ultimately rippled throughout the nation's economy too. So before I uh, call up uh, or ask our next speaker to come up, I'd like to just take a moment, given that we just, support, uh, just celebrated Memorial Day this last weekend, uh, before we continue with today's program, I wanna take just a minute, a minute to recognize all the men and women that are here today that have sacrificed so much in the defense of our nation and our most deeply held values, and they deserve the appreciation and the support uh, for their service to their incredible service to our nation. So will all the veterans that are in the room please stand and, and be recognized so we can give you the honor you so deserve. So now to tell us just a little bit more about the coalition's work here and around the country, I'd like to welcome Jason Gross. He's the executive director of the U.S. Global Leadership Co Coalition. Let's give him a round of applause as well. AJ, thank you so much for kicking off our event and demonstrating why leading globally matters so much to San Antonio. I am Jason Gross, Executive Director 
of USGLC. It is an honor to be here today in San Antonio with our honored guest, Congressman Hurd. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here, and a special thank you to our partners for today's event, who are going to be listed on our screen. First, our national global impact project partners, who, make, who help make so much of our work around the country possible. In addition, our local partners today, who are, made this event really possible. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for being part of this special event. And additionally, to our Texas Advisory Committee, um, a number of whom have joined us here today, uh, chaired by Secretary Cisneros. So as you know him in these parts, Mayor Cisneros, we are grateful for your leadership as well in making our efforts in Texas successful. So today we get to talk about America's role in the world, about the power of diplomacy and development, and to make the connection to our national security, our economic prosperity, and our values as a nation. I look forward to having this conversation with you today, but first I have a small, all tiny assignment for you as you're beginning to eat your lunch. You'll see in the middle of your table um, some pencils and some note cards. So I want to ask you for one quick assignment here. I'm going to ask you to write an answer to this question I'm going to pose to you. And that is, why does leading globally matter to Texas, to San Antonio, to you? Why does leading globally matter to Texas, to San Antonio and to you. And I'll give you a moment to write down your quick response to that, and then we'll see uh, what your answers are. Give me time to think. I know you didn't think, think it was going to be a quiz today, but just one answer. Okay. As you're writing, so let's um, let's think about your answers here too. So, why uh, why does leading globally matter to Texas, San Antonio, and to you? How many um, wrote down or were thinking of an answer along the lines of, it's the right thing to do? It's our moral responsibility. A show of hands who, who think along those lines of why it matters. I see some. Um, I, th I see a number of hands um, for that answer. I think that those who are raising their hands there are thinking, maybe inspired by the words of Ronald Reagan, who um, saw our nation as a shining city on a hill. And I think it's also appropriate now when we're thinking about that answer to recognize an important anniversary that's happened um, from a president who, uh, from this state, George W. Bush, 15 years ago launched the president's emergency plan uh, for global AIDS relief. And that known as, uh, known famously as PEPFAR by its acronym, 15 years after PEPFAR was launched, 13 million lives have been saved by that program. A remarkable achievement and something that really shows about when our moral heart is out there as a people, what, what difference we can make. Now, our job isn't done out there right now, because I have two other numbers to give you. 30 million, that's the number of people facing four famines now occurring in Africa and the Middle East. Another number for you, 65 million. That's the number of displaced persons and refugees around the world today, the highest figure since World War II. So we've made great progress, but there's still much work to be done in this area. Okay. For others who were writing down and thinking of answers, how many of you thought about something or wrote something down about our economy, that are our future jobs and economy? Well, a lot of hands here in San Antonio about that. And that's why, as AJ said, 95% thinking of this, 95% of our customers are abroad. They aren't in the United States. Uh, the fastest growing economies in the world, in the developing world, seven out of 10 in Africa. And thinking about our other countries out there, Great Britain, Japan, Germany, all um, pursuing great opportunities in the developing world in these fast-growing economies. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we keeping pace with that, or are we being left behind right now? Not to mention China, who's certainly um, extremely active in the developing world right now. So definitely food for thought. How about um, maybe another answer might have been around our national security, our safety here at home. How many wrote something along that lines? Definitely see some hands up there. I mean, we're in America's military city right here. I mean, no one knows more than San Antonio about the sacrifices that those in uniform have made for our country. 
and know about the stakes are for our global engagement. And when we go back to those figures I talked about on those famines that, uh, that are being faced by 30 million in countries like South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, we all know that food insecurity can lead to instability. Instability changes fragile states to failed states. And what happens when states fail? They create vacuum for terrorist organizations to take over that ultimately could threaten us here. So the idea is leading globally means we're trying to address problems before they come back to our shores and we have to deploy in those cases. So those connections came pretty naturally to this crowd here. I think uh, among other of our citizens, maybe they aren't so obvious necessarily. And that's where USGLC comes in, who we are. We're storytellers. We play an important role in uniting a bunch of diverse voices of the importance of America's global leadership. We are over 500 businesses, humanitarian organizations, faith-based leaders, who come around together around the importance of our civilian tools of national power, development and diplomacy. We are Democrats, Republicans, independents. Our network spans from coast to coast, from Maine to Arizona, from Washington State to Florida, and of course, right here in Texas. Our National Bipartisan Advisory Council is chaired by General Colin Powell and boasts a who's who of foreign policy and national security leaders. And we're particularly proud of the growing voice of the military in our coalition. Our National Security Advisory Council has over 200 retired three and four star flag officers. It's chaired by Admiral James DeVritis and General Tony Zinni and General Hagee is going to join us up on stage as a former co-chair of the RNSAC as well. Now, this group of generals and admirals is backed by over 30,000 veterans for smart power who have returned from the front lines of Afghanistan and Iraq to testify about the importance of civilian programs to ultimately help our national security. And what brings all these diverse voices together is a firm belief that we live in an interconnected world and that the U.S. must remain engaged in it. And that the belief that strategic investments in development and diplomacy alongside defense are essential to advancing our national interests. And the story we tell is one of a tiny sliver of the overall federal budget, that tiny 1% for the international affairs budget that is cost effective but so powerful. It's sometimes called the foreign aid budget, but it's much more than that. It includes funding our diplomats, our embassies abroad, support for our allies. It, ha it lets us uh, attack global health crises like Ebola and Zika before they reach our shores, to respond to humanitarian disasters, and to help us address the root causes of terrorism around the world. Programs that open up new markets for our goods and services to be exported, and partnerships that help rebuild war-torn cities like Mosul and Raqqa. Now, as I mentioned before, the military voice is among, among, among our most powerful in this coalition. Earlier this year, when the international affairs budget faced a 30% cut, our supporters in the military took a stand. 151 retired generals and admirals were joined by, 12, by 1,200 veterans from across the country in writing a letter to Congress. I want, you, I want to read briefly from that letter they sent to Congress. They wrote that, now is not the time to retreat and ask to ensure that our country makes the commitment necessary to prevent conflict so that we only send our brothers and sisters into uniform into harm's way as a last resort. General Mattis famously said, when testifying before Congress, he said that if you don't fund the State Department, I'm going to have to buy more ammunition. Later, as Secretary of Defense, General Mattis said, the United States has two fundamental powers, the power of intimidation and the power of inspiration. I now invite you to take a listen to some of our country's most decorated military leaders talk about the importance of that 1% of the international affairs budget, which gives us the power of inspiration. Thank you very much for being here today. Nobody in the world wants to see war less than a military guy. We've learned over the past 16 years of war that while military action is necessary, it is not always sufficient. In fact, most of the time, it's not sufficient. It takes the development folks, it takes the diplomats, and it takes the military to, to achieve our national security objectives. Those of us who have joined the National Security Advisory Council have done so with a history of service and commitment to this country. We have been in locations where we see the importance of coming together to produce long-term stability. When USAID shows up globally, 
the Department of State, the Peace Corps, when programs are in place that address those basic needs of food, education, clean water, health, then those things contribute to a more stable society. I think it's important that those of us who have seen firsthand the benefits of diplomacy and development in supporting uh, our military objectives speak out. I am for the State Department. I am for AID. When we appear on television, when we go out on the road and, and, and talk to the American people. Traveling to Africa with the policy advisors so that we could demonstrate the value of the foreign aid budget. We can go out and make the case that this is actually a high return on investment endeavor. We owe those in the State Department, those in AID, certainly those in the military, the resources to achieve the missions that have been assigned to them. One of the visits we made to Capitol Hill, I started off by saying to the senators that we met with, it, it may seem to you an anomaly that a military guy is up here arguing for the foreign aid budget, but we've seen the impact that it makes. It's a privilege to be part of the USGLC, to be associated with like-minded individuals who realize that the military can't go it alone. Now that I am out of uniform, I'm happy to be a part of a team that promotes those things for America and our friends around the globe. I don't know about you, but that was pretty powerful hearing from those generals and admirals speaking out in support of America's civilian tools for development and diplomacy. Hello, my name is Dr. Abraham Hawkes. I am president of Baptist University of the Americas here in San Antonio, just down 35. And um, I want to bring greetings to Representative Hurd and distinguished guests. Uh, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to join uh, as a part of this prestigious organization. I'm honored and I look forward to contributing at the same time, informing you about an institution of higher learning that I am privileged to lead, Baptist University of the Americas, a small university with a worldwide touch. At BUA, we have more than 70 years of history of educating Hispanic leaders and ministers to the task of forming the next generation of cross-cultural leaders. Our university, situated right here in San Antonio, has a student body that represents almost 22 different countries. The mission of BUA is the formation of cross-cultural Christian leaders, and we're accomplishing just that task. BUA graduates are starting churches all across America, serving as missionaries across the globe and working in child care organizations and in social service agencies, as well as productive employees in the marketplace. You know, with the burgeoning and need of cross-cultural leaders here in the U.S. and in Texas, BUA graduates are in high demand, and they're recruited every year by churches, denominational institutions, as well as nonprofit agencies that affect lives all over the globe. Take, for example, Keyes and Albert Abring, uh, these were students that came to BUA as ESL students. Uh, uh, Elizabeth was from Peru and Keyes is from Holland. After graduating from BUA, they served for two years in Peru as missionaries. Now they're living in Holland uh, where Keyes is working and has made the transition into the IT industry there. So BUA is a small university with a worldwide touch. Or look at, look at, you can look at the story of Dr. Rolando Aguirre who came to BUA from his native Colombia. He graduated with a bachelor's in biblical studies, went on to receive his master's and doctorate degree from other institutions here in the U.S. He now serves as a key leader and pastor of a large uh, church in the Valley of Texas. Uh, he's also president of the Hispanic Baptist Convention, which is the largest uh, Hispanic organization uh, this side of the Mississippi that represents 1,200 Texas churches here in the U.S. BUA is a small university, but with a worldwide touch. We've all heard of the statistics of the ever-increasing Hispanic population here in Texas. If you're familiar with that, look at the demographics, you know that that's happening. When it comes to faith, Hispanics will be the next generation that will impact the globe uh, for Christ. The rapid growing Hispanic population in North America has really created an urgent need, I think, for cross-cultural leadership. Developing leaders to serve globally in a cross-cultural setting for the cause of Christ and for the marketplace is what BUA is all about. I would invite you to come and join us and learn more about BUA, Baptist University of Americas, and see if that's something you could partner with. Uh, at BUA, our goal is to touch the world every day. Along with that, as someone who personally believes that promoting global development and is central to demonstrating American values and advancing our interests around the world, 
It's an honor for me to be here with you today. Today, the U.S. is providing foreign assistance in some new and more effective ways than ever before. And, and American organizations are working closely, closely and tirelessly to make the world a better and safer place, as you heard in the video. Strategic investments in these programs are critical to tackling global challenges like poverty, hunger, and disease. When organizations and universities partner with government agencies and U.S. businesses, incredible things begin to happen. From offering life-saving medical treatment to teaching girls and boys to read and write, ensuring access to clean water, providing relief for, after disasters, when America leads, as you know, we all win. I know that Congressman Hurd and other guests share that understanding. This, afternoon, uh, this afternoon's panel that we'll have today will feature General Michael Hagee, who served as the 33rd Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps from 2003 till he retired in 2006. And today he serves as a member of the former co-chair of the U.S. GLC's National Security Advisory Council. Joining General Hagee will be Sarah Thorne, who serves as the Senior Director of Global Government Affairs for Walmart and is, a, and is uh, the co-chair of the U.S. GLC's Board of Directors. We'll also welcome back U.S. GLC's Jason Gross, who just uh, visited with you just a few moments ago to the stage to moderate the discussion. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Congressman Will Hurd, a strong supporter of U.S. global leadership and someone who has devoted their uh, life to public service. From his experience serving overseas with the CIA to his seat on the Homeland Security and Intelligence Committees, Representative Hurd has been a powerful voice in support of America's investments in development and diplomacy to tackle today's most challenging threats that occur global-wide. From his brief time in Congress, he's also demonstrated that he is committed to working across the aisle to build trust and to find consensus on issues that matter most of the people of the 23rd District here in Texas, and really of all Americans around the country. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest, Congressman Will Hurd. Howdy. I know we got a few Aggies up in here. Um, before I begin, I want to recognize a couple of people in this room, um, or a group of people that are in this room. If you have served in the diplomatic corps, will you please stand up? I know there's one. Ambassador, good to see you. Yeah? I would say if you were in the CIA too, but I know some of y'all, I don't want to get some of y'all in trouble. Um, I can sit up here and, and talk to y'all about the 1% of the budget that we talked about, right? And we can, I can talk to you about how it's $54 billion, it does embassy security and construction, security assistance for key allies like Ukraine, Israel, Georgia, Egypt, Jordan, it does anti-terrorism programs, it makes sure that we're countering Russian influence, it's doing things like maintaining funding levels for democracy and humanitarian programs, it's helping oppress minorities like the Rohingya in, in Burma, um, there's programs that combat transnational criminal organizations. I can go on and I can go on. One percent's not enough is the reality. And we need to be listening to our diplomats more than what we are right now. Um, a good friend of mine and a, a, a mentor, um, he was the ambassador in, if, there, if, if an embassy had been attacked or bombed, he'd been there. He was, he was my am ambassador when, when I was in, in Pakistan, and he recently served as the head of the Bush School at Texas A&M University. And he always, he always had a saying, and I've adopted his saying, that more pumps and wingtips on the ground uh, prevents boots on the ground. And one of the things that I saw in, um, in my time when I was in the CIA, and, and maybe I should step back and give you all some background. So nine and a half years as an undercover officer in the CIA. Uh, two years at what I used to call our super secret CIA training facility called The Farm, and now it's on Google Maps. Um, <laughs> Ambassador, I wish that was a joke. Um, uh, two years in India, two years in Pakistan, two years in, in New York City doing interagency work, and then a year and a half in Afghanistan where I manage all of our undercover operations. 
And um, in addition to being the dude in the back alleys at 4 o'clock in the morning um, collecting intelligence, I had to brief members of Congress. And I was pretty shocked by the caliber of our elected officials. And I decided to leave Afghanistan, move back to San Antonio, and run for Congress. And my, for those of you who are in San Antonio, I grew up in Leon Valley. And I live in Holotus now. And I always make a joke. There's two places I never thought I'd live when I was in, growing up in Leon Valley, Afghanistan and Holotus. You know? um, uh, and I lost that first election uh, by 700 votes. I'm glad I don't tell that story anymore. Um, and then I became a partner consulting firm. We help companies grow in markets they had never been in before. So a, you, a company would come to us and say, the Shanghai Stock Exchange is getting ready to open to 39 Chinese companies. How do we get in? Or a Mexican company would come to us and say, we've operated in Latin America for 72 years. We're getting ready to buy a plant in the Philippines. What are those external factors that are going to impact our ability to make business decisions? And we would help answer those questions. And our clients came to us and had some cybersecurity questions. And we said, we know, we know a guy. And I helped start a cybersecurity company and then um, ran for Congress again in 14. And in that time, I, I've learned that in this day and age with the ability to communicate at any time of the day, the influence our diplomats on the ground has lessened because people back here in Washington, D.C. may live next door to the former finance minister of Afghanistan who hadn't been in the country for 20 years. And that person sitting on the National Security Council may listen to that person more than the people on the ground. So not only do we need to increase that 1%, we need to be listening to the people that are the representative of the presidents on that ground. Now, we also have to listen to their advice. I know my friends at the embassies in Mexico, Canada, Brussels, uh, probably advised against sanctions or, or, or um, um, the, the tariffs on our allies that were announced today. It's ridiculous. All right? you, you do not treat your allies this way. You do not want to create a trade war. And if I'm making some people uncomfortable, I apologize. I don't mean to be political, but I am a Republican, so um, I, I, can't, I can't criticize. Um, thing I learned in the CIA, be nice with nice guys, tough with tough guys. Make sure your enemies fear you and your friends trust you. And when you treat your friends this way by slapping on tariffs because of an arbitrary number that you actually don't understand, um, that erodes trust. That erodes coalitions. And the U.S. cannot show global leadership unless we do it through, through coalitions. And I don't know how this is going to, to end. Um, it's probably going to end poorly. Trade wars always do. Um, this is going to get in the way of us negotiating a, a NAFTA 2.0. And all of this while our main global adversary, China, we have one of their, an extension of their government, ZTE. We have ZTE on its knees. ZTE and Huawei are trying to create infrastructure throughout Europe, throughout Africa. Why are they trying to create, the, create that? Because they're going to have access to everything that transmits that infrastructure. You have ZTE on its knees, and what do you do? Throw them a lifeline. And then we're going to punish the best neighbors a country can ask for, Canada and Mexico. We're going to punish an entity like the EU that has been responsible for peace and prosperity uh, for 70 years. That doesn't make sense, but thank God there's a couple of us in Washington, D.C. Um, that understand these things or to continue to fight to make sure that the U.S. continues to show leadership. We have to be prepared for the global threat of China. China has made it very clear by 2049, they want to replace the United States of America as the world leader and replace us as leaders in 10 technological areas, things like artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Not only for the last couple of decades have they been stealing our information, they are now investing in their own people. Last year, eight of the top 10 venture capital deals happened in China. So they're stealing our stuff, they're building ourselves. Uh, 20 years ago, all the venture capital in the world, 92% was deployed in the United States of America. 2016, that number was only 52%. Yes, the pie has gotten bigger, but that delta has come from and is, is the investment in China 
and the investment in France. These are some of the long-term issues that we have to deal with, and the way we're going to deal with it is by working and listening to our men and women on the ground that who have spent uh, most of their life um, trying to understand other cultures and trying to promote our U.S. policy. We also have to change our thinking because when I was in, in Pakistan, if you talk to anybody who was probably over the age now, probably of 40, the first time they ever saw a glossy magazine or listened to rock music was at the American Center in Lahore or Islamabad. Now, our facilities in other countries are the most fortified place in that entire country. We are preventing our diplomats from getting out and doing their jobs. Uh, we have a bunker mentality that has to change. And as I crisscross um, my district in this country, I have a lot of people come and say, you know, we have problems right here at home. Why don't we spend that money here, not overseas? And I say, well, it's only 1% of the budget. That's like trying to, you know, you're in debt at home and you're going to stop buying vanilla lattes at Starbucks and that's going to get you out of, of debt. That's not going to happen. Uh, two, it's easier to solve the problem over there before it gets here. When um, on 9-11, when 9-11 happened, I had been in the CIA for about a year. On September 12, 2001, I was a fourth employee in a unit called the, Sin the Counterterrorism Center Special Operations Division, Division. This was the entity that prosecuted the war in Afghanistan. If you would have told me then that it would have been 17 years, and we would not have had another major attack on our homeland, I would have said you were crazy. The reason there hasn't been another attack on our homeland is because our diplomatic corps, because our intelligence agencies, because of our federal law enforcement folks like the FBI that are working hard every single day in order to keep us safe. And it starts with the relationships that we build in these other countries with our allies and with our adversaries. And in the context of the issues with North Korea, I always say, well, if you're talking, you're not fighting. And it's in the best interest for all of us to solve some of these major challenges um, through, a, through diplomacy. And, and I, I will end with this because I think y'all are more interested in, in hearing this panel discussion within this august body we have. When I was in, in Pakistan, an earthquake hit it ultimately ended up killing 200,000 people. Senator in Muzaffarabad, Muzaffarabad uh, was the regional capital of Azad Kashmir. It's the Kashmir part on, in, in, um, in, in, in Pakistan. And our ambassador at the time, Ryan Crocker, who I was talking about earlier, said, we need to figure out how we, help the, the, how we can show our support to the Pakistani people. And it was so devastating, nobody knew what was going on. And so the ambassador came to my shop and said, heard, can you take a couple people up there to Muzaffarabad and figure out what happened? And a, a drive that usually took two hours took us 11 hours. Uh, we're in an armored vehicle. <clears throat> Muzaffarabad's at 11,000 feet, middle of the winter. Um, when you're in a one-ton vehicle driving across bridges, you know, at 11,000 feet, you take your time. <laughs> um, and when we get there and we realized what they needed was airlift because there was a lot of small villages higher up in elevation from the main city of Muzaffarabad that were cut off from food, water, and power. So we put in a call, we get 22 Chinooks, you know, within about nine hours, and we started deploying these Chinooks to these small villages, picking people up. And I'd been there for about three days, and, and by the way, I don't think I said it, it's negative 20 degrees below zero at night by the way, um, and, and I was living in a tent, and I had a um, general, the, um, the sleeping bags where I was told was supposed to keep you warm up to negative 20 degrees below zero. I was not warm at that time. Um, I still haven't been able to log my complaint. Um, and I was supposed to go down to, to, to Islamabad, the capital, give a report to the ambassador, and I was gonna take one of these Chinooks down to the city, and we had learned there was a village had been without food, water, power for three days. So we said, hey, let's go pick them up, take them to Islamabad too. That's where this a little mini refugee camp is being set up. We land, open these big bay doors, 250 villagers literally start piling on. And there was a village elder hands me a little girl who was seven years old. She lost her mother and father 
in the, the earthquake. And she's screaming bloody murder, because if any of y'all have ever seen a helicopter crew in full kit, they look like they're from out of space. And so I'm holding on a little girl, and halfway through our trip, she settles down and, and rests her head on my shoulder and goes to sleep. And we land, and the big bay doors open. I put her down on the ground, and she runs away, and she takes about 10 steps, turns around, comes back, and kisses the helicopter crewman on the hand, right? Um, and he gives her a thumbs up, and she smiles a little bit and gives a thumbs up, and then she runs away. And I will, for the rest of my life, have that little girl's face seared into my brain because it's the example of how the United States of America is the only country with the resources and the willingness to help people even if they're 6,000 miles away. And that is why Leading Globally Matters to Texas and the United States of, the, uh, of America is to be the example for the rest of the world. And just know there's a few of us that are trying to promote that. It's great to have folks like y'all that are there. So God bless you, and may God continue to bless each United States of America. Congressman, thank you for those remarks, really showing, I think, how fortunate the folks in this room are to have you representing them in Washington. So thank you very much for really starting off our program the right thing. We're going to have a uh, discussion now that I'm going to moderate with our great guest, General Hagee. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your friendship and support for USGLC over the years. And Sarah Thorner, Walmart, thank you for coming today to join us as well. So why don't we start our discussion um, today uh, thinking about national security. And I want to start with some uh, framing ideas on that um, to think about uh, a guy some of you must have heard of. He represented uh, Texas uh, down the road out east uh, a few years ago. His name was Charlie Wilson. Um, the, uh, wrote a book about him called Charlie Wilson's War, a movie starring Tom Hanks. And to think about that, that story takes place in Afghanistan, um, which Congressman Heard knows so well, serving there, General Hagee as well. Um, and uh, the story, of course, is Charlie Wilson helped uh, fund a uh, covert operation to help drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan, succeeded, they, they left. And after the war happened, uh, Charlie Wilson went back to his colleagues in the House Appropriations Committee and said, well, now do you think we could, just as a starting fund, maybe a uh, million dollars to rebuild schools and roads in war-torn Afghanistan? And they all kind of laughed at him, and they mocked him, and they said, who are you, the congressman from Kabul? And um, so that went nowhere. And we don't know how that story might have gone a different way, but it's something to think about. Um, would we know what would have happened had we invested in development and diplomacy at that time in Afghanistan? Maybe we would have seen a different story written. We're not sure. But thinking about that right now, let's think about national security, about how we engage in the world. General Hagee, you um, helped lead a USGLC trip to Africa a few years ago to Kenya and Ethiopia, I believe. Um, both developing countries with a lot of promise, but also facing a lot of unique threats as well. Can you tell us um, what you saw on that trip and the challenges they face from uh, terrorist organizations to illegal wildlife trafficking, um, regional instability, and, um, and also the impact of what happens in Africa, how it eventually reaches us here at home? Yeah, they do face threats from terrorism and the various things you mentioned. But on a much more fundamental level, they, they face hunger. They face trying to take care of their families. They face trying to find a job. We went to a uh, village in Ethiopia. Uh, no electricity for miles around. A very poor dirt road in. The village uh, initially had no water. Uh, a farmer that we met with lived on, he had a farm, and he had two cows, and it, the size of his farm, including the house where he lived, and a little area where they had the cows was probably smaller than a, a small lot here in San Antonio. Uh, when we talked with the family, uh, 
had four kids. They were unable to feed the kids, and they were unable to provide education for the kids. This is a significant issue for those people. USAID came in. They didn't have enough money to uh, help the entire village, but they helped this one farmer. He was farming like they did in biblical times. Cows did not produce enough milk to take care of the family. Through help from USAID, they taught him how to do hy uh, hydra farming. I won't go through all that, but they taught him how to do that and how to feed those two cows with a little shelter that they built. And he could produce enough food for those cows every single day continuously. Within a month, he was producing enough milk to take care of his family. They were able to sell the rest of the milk so they could actually send their children to school. He obtained enough money to dig a well, only wells village had. Did he charge for the villagers to come get water? No, because it was a family type of thing. USAID did not have enough money to help the other villagers, but they came over, saw what he was doing, and they copied it. When we arrived there, they were actually starting to, to use our terminology, create wealth. They set up a cooperative where they were selling milk, and they laid it on USAID and the United States. They were starting to build a small infrastructure there, starting to feel secure, starting to feel good about themselves, and in my opinion, that will prevent terrorists from coming in. That will prevent all those other problems that you listed because they're able to take care of themselves. And USAID and that little small 1% that's been talked about provided that there. It was really quite inspiring. That's, that's, that is a great story to recount from that trip. Congressman, um, you uh, had so many examples in your, in your opening address of examples of where investments, Mr. Guard, we saw the general saying we, we could have done even more there with a little bit more if we had uh, additional USAID funding. Um, when it comes to the, your security lens about what it means uh, for our interests all around the world as an agent, as an analyst that you've been out there, is there one story that you gave there that really crystallizes why you called it's unacceptable the amount where, where there were funding right there or it needs to be more? Or is there another one you didn't have there? I mean, what is it really, when you prioritize, there's one single reason why, why we have to do this. So you can say whatever you want to say about Afghanistan and what has happened in the, in the last um, 17 years. Um, when you look at the map of provinces that are, are contested with the Taliban, um, you know, the map looks almost as bad, if not worse, than it was when I left in 2009. However, there are a million girls hmm. in school in Afghanistan. And that is why I think ultimately that the future of Afghanistan is going to be bright, is when you take, when you're now activating 50% of your population. Now imagine what more we could have done if we were able to build those schools faster. Um, Imagine what we could have done if we put some of these programs to teach them in, in, in those classrooms. Uh, imagine the trajectory of, of Afghanistan, um, because when you're able to build these communities, when you're able to have something that you can defend, then guess what? You're going to stop, you know, you're, you're going to step up against the Taliban. You're going to stop them from coming in. You can take the same principles and apply it uh, to northern Mexico when it comes to dealing with the narco traficantes. So, so uh, that's, an, I think, an, an example of if we were able to put a little bit, it's not that hard to build a school, right? It's not that hard uh, to, 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 train, to train people. And if, if we were able to increase that by 50%, how, where would Afghanistan be mm -hmm. right now? Sarah, the Congressman mentioned a million um, girls um, in school in Afghanistan. Um, I'm not sure everyone always thinks <laughs> of working on uh, programs for women and girls mean for national security in this case, for economic growth. That's something you and Walmart have done a lot with. Can you talk some more uh, of the areas where you guys have led in that? Sure. Um, so many of you know Walmart. A lot of Walmarts here in Texas. 
I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say we had over 4,200 employees in your district. So, sorry. Um, but we're in 28 markets around the world, and many of those markets are emerging markets. And we figured out pretty quickly that the best way to create economic security um, and growth in those markets, which in turn hopefully those people will come and shop at our stores, was to empower women. Um, women control the majority of consumer spending, over $20 billion trillion dollars of consumer spend. They are half of our associates, half of our employees, and they make really those decisions when they go in the markets. In addition, women tend to invest in their families. So if you empower women, you tend to create a real multiplier effect. And so what we ended up doing was saying, if we really care about helping the people in the communities where we have stores and clubs and where we source from, the best thing we can do is to empower women. So we looked at our supply chain and said, where do we intersect with women? Um, and we figured out in a lot of places, on farms, in factories, um, from the women-owned businesses we source from, and then even at the sort of the top level, we tend to be, we're a big company, we're a $500 billion company, um, so a lot of the um, companies in the United States and around the world have sort of a team that says, we're the Walmart team. And so we said to those folks, well, tell us who's representing you on the Walmart team. Are there women? Uh, what's the minority and diversity makeup of that team? And by <coughs> asking that question, creating better gender and diversity. Um, the best thing about this program, we put some real targets in against it, training a million farmers, sourcing $20 billion for the US market from women-owned businesses, was it wasn't just the, the right thing to do, it was good for Walmart. We got better suppliers that were more intuitive, that knew what our customers would want. We created competition in markets when there wasn't competition. Women in factories, you know, a lot of the women in Bangladesh come from the farms into the factories. They have no training. But if you can give them some numeracy and literacy, some understanding of their, their inherent self-worth, then they don't leave those factories as quickly. The productivity goes up, their safety, their security, and their family benefits. So it was and it is a continuing, you know, it's an endeavor for us. And one of the best things about it was we ended up doing a lot of partnering mm. because we are the market. So we could work with USAID mm. and say, you know, on that farmer program, we're the market. Yeah. Mm. So we will help those, we will tell you what we want to buy. You aid, you know what you're doing. You go train those farmers, we'll buy it, we'll create sustainable programs. For women-owned businesses, let's do joint training on capacity building um, with the State Department. We did a program called We Americas, where we empowered women throughout Western Hemisphere with the State Department and the American Development Bank, and really bringing all these resources together because we were kind of that anchor of the market. And so creating this sort of market-led development is really something that, that we believe in and something that we want to continue to mm. partner with ultimately because it's not just good for Walmart, it's good for society and there's a really positive loop mm -hmm. that, that you start by creating that spark. C can I add on to that? Please, and, and, it's and, your show. And, and, and what uh, Walmart is also in improving supply chain management, which um, is actually a sustainability issue. I, I see my friends at North American Development Bank here mm -hmm. talking about how do you make sure produce gets to, um, to the market quicker so there is not spoilage, there's not waste. And so now you're 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 you know you're creating more efficiency and to address those problems that the general's talking about the, the food scarcity and some of these problems mm -hmm. and so being able to leverage um, private sector uh, talent uh, like Walmart is, is a way that we that we're able to deliver in in a um, you know at, at a good price point right? right because the U.S. government's not having to do it and we're we're improving that, those efficiencies. Mm -hmm. Um, made, a, made a pretty good bridge there from <laughs> national security to economic security, helping out national security. Yeah. When we turned to economics too, a lot of hands went up early when we talked about why that means uh, leading globally is so important to San Antonio and this region for economic connections. Um, we talked about a lot of figures out there about what markets were. Got another one, Texas exports more than $280 billion in goods and services to foreign markets. And that's a significant part of this economy about connecting to our neighbors in the north and south and, over, and, and overseas. Um, Sarah, you, you have some specific examples there, but um, talk to us more about some of what the building blocks of what, what the U.S. government does abroad that can help out companies in the long term. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. The fact is, um, let me throw some other numbers out. 11 of our top 15 export markets today 
were once U.S. were once recipients of U.S. foreign assistance. Yeah. I mean, I think that shows what over the long term of what these partnerships do, from helping out because the right thing to do to becoming our eventual markets for exports. Talk about what that long-term engagement is. Absolutely. Means. So, you know, even just to, to think about that farmer example, we've spent a lot of time in Central America where we have stores and clubs helping those local farmers be suppliers to us. And the best example is when they come to us, they learn our systems and processes, and they start to vertically integrate, and they say, you know, I, I like my El Salvador market, but I'd rather have the U.S. market. And we have a free trade agreement with Central America, and we can really help those, those smallholder farmers become entrepreneurs by getting into that global jet stream that is Walmart um, global trade and providing you all here fruits and vegetables year round. I think people forget about trade, that it really is a benefit to consumers to be able to have the products that you want, the prices you want, when you want them. Um, we buy an awful lot of flowers from Colombia. I'd rather buy flowers than Colombia than have Colombia selling other things to us to make them. Like, think of what an amazing success story Colombia is now compared to 20, 30 years ago when it was a real threat to our economic and national right. security. Um, same thing in Ecuador. You know, trade can lead to inclusive growth. And you know, just spinning out the, the steel tariffs. So you would think, well, Walmart and steel, Except for the fact that when you walk into a store, what does every product sit on? Steel racking and decking and everything in our distribution centers. And what do you build new stores out of? Rebar. Oh, and what drives all of the product around in a store? Forklifts. And what are they made of? 80% steel. So putting tariffs, you know, going backwards on this sort of expansionist and opening markets and breaking down barriers to closing markets, it's going to cost more from us. Now, the Mexicans are going to say, guess what we're going to retaliate? You know what they're going to retaliate on? Avocados. Boom. Um, <laughs> cheese, which we export Spoiler. from Wisconsin. Apples, which we export from Washington State. Uh, blueberries, which we export. Grapes, which, you know, so my, now my stores and clubs in Mexico, their consumers are going to pay more for those products. And at 1.30 today, I'm sure the Canadians are going to tell you what they're going to retaliate against. So it, it's really frustrating for somebody who, my whole life I've been doing trade policy to break down barriers and relying on the U.S. government to set an example to say, this is good for us, competition is good for us, it's good to have lower tariffs, it's good for consumers, it creates competition, to have this sort of self-inflicted injury where consumers are ultimately, and our farmers are going to be the ones that are going to be hurt the most. It's really frustrating. Sorry. That's what I spent my whole morning doing. <laughs> And to, to add but I was on very happy to hear your remark. No, to, to add on again, but, but we have a chronic, we, we have an acute problem, right? The tariffs right now, NAFTA 2.0, but we have a chronic problem, is that people don't think free trade and international trade is a good thing. Right. And, and so that's why it takes organizations like this and it takes individuals like all of y'all. We have to keep talking about this. Um, and, and once we get through this current problem, we're going to have to continue to keep talking about the principles and the importance of this, and we're never going to be able to stop. Um, because I, you would be shocked if I told you, even in my district, 29 counties, 820 miles of the border with Mexico, the number of people that think if that, that think free trade is not helpful to the Texas economy. And so, so for those of us that understand this and support this, we're going to have to continue to talk about this and educate our employees, educate our suppliers, educate our peers um, on the importance of this particular issue. General, Sarah brought up Colombia, now exports cut flowers to us and they're important markets right now. You look at Plan Colombia and our efforts over the long term about um, a uh, diplomatic and security engagement then for years, which has paid off. This was a na failed narco state a couple decades ago, now a trading partner with us. What does it say about the capacity to do something like Plan Colombia, the success there, but the importance of efforts like that? You know, when I was in, I was in uh, Chile uh, a, uh, a couple of years ago, not very long ago, and they came, and I had several acquaintances down there, both uh, uh, military and civilian, and their comment to me was, General Hagee, where is the U.S.? We want to be involved with the U.S. The Chinese, to the congressman's point, they're everywhere down here, uh, and 
we want to be involved with the U.S. We need to be, we were, uh, in fact, I met with uh, President Arribi some time ago mm -hmm. when he was uh, helping solve that, uh, solve that particular problem. We need to be down there in those countries around the world. As the Congressman mentioned, uh, most of the countries, even the ones that we say, well, they don't really like us, they want our leadership. Mm -hmm. They want us to be involved, and to your point, they want to be able to trust us. So it is significant. Uh, East Timor, not very many people remember East Timor. Uh, the country was falling apart. They were in civil war. We got involved, the United States got involved behind the scenes. You, those of you who remember the, the Australians, quote, let it. Uh, we talked with the Australians. I think I can talk about this now. It's long enough ago. The Australians We're all let friends it. here. Yeah. We got with the Australians and we said, we will guarantee that you will be successful. The United States cannot lead first time into Asia like that. Someone who is in there, in the area, has to lead. The Australians stepped up and led it. And East Timor, actually one of the first successes by the UN, in my opinion, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> hopefully not the last. Uh, it was very successful, and East Timor and West Timor are doing well economically, and they're involved with the United States. The United States needs to be out and about. Mm -hmm. Congressman, you talked, I mean, we're talking about competition also, and you brought up China there, and a main, uh, one of our great global competitors out there. I want to read a couple of figures there about what they're, what they're doing also. Um, China's increased its development assistance by 780% in recent years, and doubled its diplomacy budget under President Xi. What do, they, what do they get, what's going on out there in the developing world that maybe not everyone here gets about, uh, about what the importance is? And also going back to your time in service, what you've seen about uh, other Chinese efforts and competition around the, around the globe. So the Chinese have a 25-year plan, and they have an emperor who's going to be on the throne for the next 40 years. And they have an authoritarian government that can implement that 25-year uh, plan. And everybody's heard of the One Belt, One Road. Um, China is fairly resource poor, and they've decided that we have to be connected to all the resources we need in order to be the leader in those 10 industries that I, that I alluded to earlier. And they're going in, and, and look, they're using debt as a way to force some of these countries to work with them. Uh, the one positive, or, or, or a positive, there's, there's several positives. All the places that China has gone into, most of those countries hate them. And they're not using, they're, they're, they're not seeing value locally. They, they bring in um, workers from China, they only use Chinese um, companies. And so uh, some of these countries and some of these municipalities there have felt a little gypped. And they all say, hey, why can't we go in? And, and a lot of times you have people not go in in some of these places, more austere environments in, in Africa and other parts of Asia because of a perceived security concern. Um, I believe all those things are, are manageable, and we have to be looking from a public and private sector on how we can be working together um, in order to take advantage of these opportunities. And, and, if, and if anybody um, doesn't think that, that China is on this march, um, last year they created a, the first military base outside of China in Djibouti. Why in Djibouti? Well, just look on a map where Djibouti is, and that tells you everything. And so. Um, so, so we need to be engaging, and at a minimum, let's start in our hemisphere, right? Like this isn't this isn't hard. Um, let's let's start with Mexico, and yeah. you know, let's build natural gas pipelines all the way down to Chile. You know, um, so uh, it, it is. It, it's this. This shouldn't. This isn't difficult. Um, but we need to make sure folks at the top get this. Um, and but many, and having organizations again like this promoting this um, is important. Uh, while we move to values, when I asked that question, what leading globally matters, a number of hands went out about values as Americans, what we do. I want to talk about um, uh, another audience question here about perceptions of how we've been doing in, in expressing our values. Uh, I want to show a hands here um, of over the last 20 years, has extreme global poverty gone down, gone up? or stayed the same. So how many people think extreme global poverty over the last 20 years has gone up? Raise your hands if it's gone up the last 20 years. How many think it has gone down? 
How many think it has stayed the same? Okay, second group, you got it right, um, along with 5% of Americans who got it. These are perceptions that we have out there now too, but over tw last 20 years, the number of people around the world living under extreme poverty defined as less than $1.25 a day has been cut in half. Uh, number of kids under five dying of preventable diseases cut in half. Um, millions more going to school, as the congressman said, around the world. So we've had successes that are going on. That's, that's the amazing thing, that development does work um, when it's funded. I guess, but look, other challenges still arise, and I want to turn to the congressman on this. We've seen the headlines right now of something we thought that was done, Ebola. Now headlines showing the Democratic Republic of Congo, 20 deaths recently from this. Um, what does that tell you about the need that the United States and its allies right now to start investing in more robust global health prevention in order to keep these diseases from reaching our shores? What does that say about our need right now to stay focused and engaged on keeping these uh, diseases from but coming back? Ebola, you can even, even more basic problems that are still <laughs> haven't been still haven't been uh, eradicated. Malaria? Yeah, and, and so, so this is, again, it's easier to stop the problem before it comes on our shores. Um, there's, there's technology here in the United States that we should be deploying in these places. There's a company right here in, in San Antonio that has this like germ zapping um, um, a robot mm. that you know kills most every every germ there is, and the, the stats are ridiculous. Let's let's send a let's send a few of those. Yeah. You know, Xenex. I don't know if Xenex is here. Uh, X E N E X. Um, but that's a, a, an example. This is the kind of leadership we should be yeah. we should be we should be using. But then also we have to evaluate here in the United States. What is our response to these kind of um, uh, events? And when you saw what happened in Dallas a few years ago, or a few months ago, I I'm, 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 um, forget the timeline. Do we have the resources to stop this if, mm -hmm. it, does, if it does come here? Um, one of the things in Congress, it's real easy to, you think about these um, low probability, high impact events, and you don't want to fund those because you're like, oh, that's not going to happen. But we got to be prepared so that um, when it does, we're, we're ready. General, one way that um, our military uh, works hand in hand with our civilian leaders and expressing America's values is coming to help those who have suffered from um, disasters, natural, humanitarian. Um, certainly the people of Texas know about um, a natural disaster that happened uh, last year recovering from hurricanes at that point. But when it, be it a hurricane and Haiti or uh, an earthquake in Haiti, hurricanes in the Caribbean. Uh, what does that say and what are your experiences when the best of America's military leaders can work with our civilian leaders to bring help and what does that do for the face and image of America abroad when we respond to those who are in need? No, it's really quite significant. Uh, I re uh, you might recall uh, we had, there was a significant uh, uh, tsunami in Indonesia when we were when we were in Iraq, we were we were engaged in Iraq, and the tsunami came through and and hit Indonesia towards the uh, towards the end of that year, and we responded with uh, an aircraft battle group. I, you know, said, well, well, why is there an aircraft battle group down there? To it came out of Japan, moved down into Indonesia, and l we launched both civilian and military around the islands there, provided help, uh, rescued people, and provided food, provided medicine, spent mm, four or five months down there, never had a military individual on the ground overnight. They always came back out to ship, uh, and then we provided relief uh, the next day. Before the tsunami hit, a poll had been done throughout Indonesia about their perception of the United States. 75% hated the United States, primarily because what was going on in Iraq, they saw that as attack against Islam. Six months after we had provided relief down there, 75% of the Indonesians supported the United States. Significant, and I, I could tell several Somalia Somalia, the same thing in, in, in the 90s. When we get involved on a humanitarian basis, both the military and the diplomats 
it is significant for us. If, you, if you've never seen the CBs, man, these guys are geniuses. I, I always think everything in the federal government bill should be built by the CBs because <laughs> they'll get it done in like two days. Um, but it, it, it looked at this, you, you, there's every example, any time our men and women in the military go in and solve these problems, it's uh, the professionalism, the capabilities, and they always leave those places better off than they were when they first got in. And you're certainly someone who, who appreciates public opinion polls. And you said that <laughs> seeing a switch like that is, is, yeah, uh, is hey, no small cheese. Maybe I, maybe I need to get a few of those in. Right. right. Now in November. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well timed. Um, before we go to the audience for questions, Sarah, one question for you right now um, on uh, thinking about spreading the best of our values and public private partnerships out there. Walmart's done so much in agriculture. You've talked about that, about addressing food security and food supply. What, what is that about the best of bringing the, both the public side and the private side to your work around, around the world to build hope and, uh, and also deliver some of the best of our values? Yeah, I think um, sort of it's in Walmart's DNA and our mission to help people live better. Um, it is our mission statement, save money, live better. And over the last, 20, 30 years, we've been thinking about what does live better really mean for people? Um, and, it, and it really comes back to sort of human dignity. That's what people want. They want opportunity. Um, they want to be able to feed their kids, and they want to be able to leave their children up better off then. And for us, that we can help with that by helping to provide economic opportunity, by being more inclusive by the way we source, yeah. by being more deliberate in the training we're giving to people both our own associates, um, as well as um, people within our supply chain. Um, but we can't do it alone. You know, we don't know the best farming practices. We may not be able to train uh, women and girls on how to become a retail associate, but we can partner. We can partner with USAID. We can partner with the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, and you can create that bridge is what's missing sometimes for many, many people in the developing world, which is they just never got the chance, right? So they need just a little step so they can get into the private sector and then create um, their future for themselves. And that's really what you want. It's the, the hand up. Um, and so that's the kind of partnership that we've been really designed, a very, very much in the approach of shared value, which says, look, if we're going to partner, it has, there has to be an objective for the government or the nonprofit. But we, we should do too. We don't, we used to just give money away. And it was nice, it was easy. Like I gave money to CARE and that was good. It's harder actually to say, I'm gonna work with CARE and these are the outcomes that mm. I want and I'm gonna put my business into it and my merchants are gonna adopt small businesses and they're gonna teach them how to become part of my supply chain. It takes a lot more work, but then for us the outcome is much more beneficial not just to us, but to those people that we're empowering. And I will tell you, the women we get into our supply chain, they train other women. Mm. They pass it on. And they become, they become the best advocates for Walmart. So it really helps us with our license to operate in many countries around the world where our reputation as a big multinational may have come in before we could get there. Um, so we're huge advocates, and that's why we, we spend so much time with you all. But it really is, I would say, it's in everybody's self-interest to be thinking about how do we create that inclusive growth? Because that really, it, it creates a safer world, it creates a more secure world, and it creates a better company. We, ended up being, we end up being a much more efficient, much better company because we have suppliers that are committed to us, we have associates that want to work with us, and we have communities that are thriving. Great. Your model's really working well. Yes, um, it, I mean, I think, I hope it's the model. I mean, the private sector can't do everything, mm -hmm. and I worry a little bit when aid organizations say, we'll just have the private sector mm. do it. No, no, we really need to In create concert. that partnership yeah. because there are places, A, we won't go, mm -hmm. B, there's stuff we don't know how to do, and we need that partnership to help us really make it <coughs> sustainable. Great. Um, yeah. Great conversation so far. I want to hear from you right now. So my colleagues, Jonathan and Alex, have a uh, microphone. So if you want to raise your hand, be recognized, we'll uh, have a conversation for a few minutes. Great. Alex. Uh, please uh, say, give your name and uh, organization and everything, too. Uh, tell thank you. Are. I'm Peter Gravick. I'm with the UTSA International Trade Center. And one of, a couple of things I was thinking about, um, one of the, one of the old, there's an old saying, demographics is destiny. And we have a uh, population that is aging, 
the Europeans do, the Japanese do, Chinese will in a couple decades. Europe, uh, sorry, uh, the Middle East and Africa have a large demographic glut of young, of a young population. And you know, they're, if they're not up at two, two billion bet between them, they're getting very close to it. Um, one of you mentioned Charlie Wilson's war and, and the lessons that have, that have been um, learned from that. And another, another saying is it's, you know, it's easy to win the war, it's sometimes harder to win the peace. So I know that um, in, in a attending to, to this large population, uh, in Charlie Wilson's war you had the Mujahideen which became the Taliban today, you've got remnants of ISIS, remnants of Al-Qaeda, Lashkar Toiba, Boko Haram, you know, you can go, go on and on. Um, but as the military begins to pull back, because you know, the, the, the need for them, the active need for them won't be there, in winning the peace, yeah. you know, how can we approach that? I know that Lindsey Graham had said something to the effect of building more, building more schools in Afghanistan to empower women. You know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll have a larger effect than any bomb will um, in the long run. So what can we do in terms of addressing this young population in terms of education so in the future? Useful bold question and uh, winning the peace after, after the war. My old boss, uh, Hank Crumpton, uh, in the CIA State Department and then also in private sector always say beam old episodes of Oprah you know and that would uh, that would solve some of, some of these problems um, so, uh, we are we have fallen down on some of our pu public diplomacy initiatives um, and so when you talk about funding the State Department funding aid um, you got to look at where is that money going and one of the areas that sometimes is lacking is ultimately public diplomacy, mm -hmm. which is going to be outreach to some of these communities so that the young population, like if, if Maroon 5 goes to one of these countries, guess what? There's going to be thousands of screaming people there, right? Let's, let's take, <laughs> we got a Maroon 5 fan up here in front. Um, you know, we, like we, we, ha we, we forget that piece. We forget that piece of, of exporting our culture and our, and our habits and that's something we need to be a little more. I tell you, I started my career working in the program, the part of the State Department that sends American artists abroad, and I traveled for six weeks through Southeast Asia and Middle East with a ballet company and a Native American storyteller, and they were from Washington State, and it was extraordinary because we would go into these communities and do um, the the ballerinas. They would do lessons with the local artists, but then you'd have an event that the, the State Department would put on and all of the, the culture, the cultural elites would come. So you were creating this track to diplomacy by just sending a ballet company around the world and they were incredible ambassadors for the United States. These were just beautiful kids with the most discipline and, and just the, the best manners and we were exporting our culture in a way that allowed us to tell a different story than you might see on CNN or that you might see with just one image. And, and I remember th when I was working in the program, they're like, well, we have CNN, we don't need you. And I was mm. like, go on one of these programs. Right. You're going to see how much we need you. That's a post-Cold War lesson about you know, the imperative of the Cold War was we needed to have this active public diplomacy, public broadcasting. We pulled back from that. I think General's got something to say about that, yeah, too. The, uh, with all due respect, I think the question was not exactly right. Uh, what are, if you go to war, uh, whether it's an all-out war or a smaller war, what are the end objectives? You said win the war but lose the peace. Uh, no, that's part of the problem. We have to have another site in mind besides beating the enemy. World War II, in my opinion, World War II is the last time we will, we will see unconditional surrender. And what did we do after World War II and unconditional surrender? We had the Marshall Plan. We spent years on standing Europe back up, years on standing Japan back up. And has that been a benefit to us? I think so, yes. The, the idea that we should go in and uh, beat the Taliban and then everything is going to turn out all right is one of the problems that we have here. It is education. It is food. You talked about the large number of young people. Uh, what about 50% of them unemployed? 18-year-old mm. guys standing on corners, hands in their pockets, unemployed. That's not going to be a good outcome. Uh, can we solve that in a year or two years or five years? Marshall Plan took decades. 
we have to, in my opinion, we have to be dedicated to help these countries over a long period of time. Education, food, help them build their security. Otherwise, we're going to be repeating ourselves over and over and over again, wondering why we can't do it. Whenever I meet any anybody who's ever spent any time in national security, I always ask the question, what day do we celebrate when it comes to the global war on terrorism? And it, it, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, that terrorism is like influenza. You're never going to get rid of it, um, but you, you can, inc you, you can, you can in, you know, improve communities res and build their resistance to, to, to this problem. But we have to think about what is that, what is that environment, what does that framework look like? Um, if the Taliban comes to the table, what is, what is that next step? Uh, what happens? What is reunification between North and South Korea actually look like if Kim Jong Un is is willing to disable uh, to dismantle their their nuclear program? Uh, not enough thought is going into that plan. Um, it comes, you know, it's it, we know, and the military is the best in the world in saying we can um, demolish all of these things. We can uh, bring people, uh, stop them from doing X, Y, and Z. But what is that next step? And again, who plays a role in that? State Department. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, you got a question over there, I think. Uh, thank you, panel. My name is uh, Tim Farrell, and I'm very gratified to be one of the Texas state leaders for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. have been doing that for a few years, and I'm also part of the Veterans for Smart Power initiative around the nation. I was very thank gratified you. to be able to sign on to the letter advocating for the international affairs budget. And, Congressman, uh, everyone involved, grateful for your, uh, your help in passing that budget. We've, um, we've talked amongst the panel today about some terrific initiatives that uh, the United States has done in terms of our involvement, uh, gr making former aid partners trade partners, doing things like uh, going into East Timor and bringing a country, uh, supporting a country like Australia. But what we've talked about uh, today a lot has been predominantly, it at least appears on the surface, the binary relationships we've had. We've gone in as the United States, done the right thing in a diplomatic sense, in a development sense, in an aid sense, and we've had some terrific outcomes. But I'd be curious uh, to each of your perspective, in terms of America's leadership on the world stage, um, serving as a catalyst for a truly global leadership coalition, especially with the perceptions of the 1%, which we believe is a pittance of the federal budget, but a lot of people don't. How do we, how do we, take our leadership on the global stage and make that a catalyst for other nations to truly jump onto this global leadership coalition, believe in our believe in our agenda, and help out in things like defeating ISIS, like improving things, stabilization and denuclearization of North Korea, as well as bringing a truly global coalition into response to natural disasters. Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I can give one example. In Somalia, we went in there for. Uh, this is in the in the early 90s. Uh, Somalia was having a civil war. They were starving. Hundreds of people were dying every day. Uh, in the end, with the United when the United States went in, uh, I was there. Uh, we had 30 different countries come in as that coalition. Uh, why? Because the United States said, "Follow us." We went in there, we stopped the hunger, we stopped the fighting. Uh, NGOs came in, other, other outfits came in. When we got ready to leave in uh, April of the following year and handed over to the UN, I was the liaison to the warlords and they came up to me, they said, Colonel Haji, I was a colonel at the time and they loved it, you know, the Haj, Colonel Haji, they thought it was a big joke. I said, Colonel Haji, Colonel Haji, if the United States stays, we'll solve our problem. If you leave, in other words, turn it over to the UN, we will go back to fighting. That's exactly what happened. Since we were there, the coalitions you talked about formed. We have to provide that leadership because by and large, countries know that when we go in, we're not looking for more land, we're not looking for anything for us. Oh, if we develop business and it comes back, that's fine, but it also helps you. They know that we're going in there for the right reason. That's terrific, General, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Congressman, if I could follow up with a bit of a loaded um, addendum to that question. 
make it quick since we have some others. How does the America First kind of portrayal of our international involvement make that a little more difficult? Well, of course it makes it difficult. Um, let's, let's, let's look at NATO. The, the re, there's the reason that there was 70 years of peace and prosperity in Europe is because of NATO and the EU, and the reason NATO and the EU NATO work is because of the United States of America. There's never been 70 years of peace and prosperity in Europe except during this 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 time. So those are examples that that where you have a very specific mission, right, countering the Russian threat. Now you're seeing NATO expand into some more of the counterterrorism fight because that is getting in the way of us to be able to counter Russia. So, so you have a very specific goal there. If you, want to, if you want to compare and contrast that to the EU, 26 member nations that have very unique, look, I think it's hard dealing with um, uh, two parties, let alone 26 you know, countries that each have like seven parties you have to deal with. And they have difficulties of doing something like countering um, disinformation. You know, the EU did a report, 83 pages, not once did they say the word Russia, right? Um, so that is a, that is a multilateral um, um, in, structure that is difficult because they have to solve so many things. But if we <laughs> stay focused, and I think one area we should do that is in cybersecurity. Uh, that's why I think getting rid of um, Ambassador Painter at the State Department was a bad thing because we need to make sure every country has a criminal law on the books that's saying hacking is bad. Uh, that's an area where we can have a very narrow focus and build uh, an international coalition that's gonna be helpful for the rest of the world. Great. We have a couple more questions, I think. Alex, you have one over here. Uh, thank so, you, Matthias Hoffabert from UTSA uh, Global Affairs Department. And just following up on this question, since you mentioned NATO already, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about leadership in international organizations uh, because I, I, I would just like to second my impression from the discussion so far. For me, being a non-American, just being here after five years and uh, just finally getting the green card and everything, I think there's a bit of an American exceptionalism in all of this, uh, which is if the U.S. leads, that's great, but again, it has to be a constructive, inclusive leadership, I think. Uh, after years, and it's not just the current administration, this goes all the way back to, to the Bush administration at least, and, and really there's a lot of mistrust, let's be honest about this, globally towards U.S. leadership in Europe, for example. And uh, just what happened today with the terrorists will not help it in any way. So I think the U.S. has to take a step back, not in terms of letting go of leadership, but having a different kind of leadership for the 21st century. Not just the American exceptionalist leadership will just lead and you guys follow, right? It's kind of like the old school. Um, sure. It has to be a bit more of an inviting, we, we follow the rule of law just like everyone else. We're interested in international law just as everyone else. We're willing to maybe sign off to some international treaties like everyone else. Um, Good uh, thoughts. No, is, is that kind of leadership yeah, that yeah, you yeah, can yeah. envision? Relationships be between countries are just like relationships between people. And if you don't spend time nurturing them, then they're going to fall apart. And, and I think at every level of government, uh, and, and Congress is, is at fault for this too, whenever we travel, we often travel to the latest problem set. Uh, we're not stopping in Paris, we're not stopping in London, we're not seeing you know, some of our traditional allies, and so you have to spend time um, to do that. And, and guess what, if, if we want a world that's based, on, that's rule-based, we're gonna have to be engaged. Right? Uh, simple as that. But also I would say, yes, the rhetoric of, of the president is one thing, but he is one person. Yes, he's a titular head of the party, but not everybody believes that way. And there's plenty of, of voices in, in, in Congress, on, in the House and the Senate, um, that, ha that, 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 do, that talk about the opposite things. And I always joke, I get frustrated because every crazy thing uh, a Republican says, I always get asked, what do you think about that? I was like, it's a crazy thing said by a Republican. You know, right? Like, you what else am I supposed to say, right? Um, but do they always take the things that the normal ones say <laughs> and say, well, what do you think about this? That, 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 that doesn't happen. And so just know that there is, I, I, I would say, the bulk of the folks in, in Congress writ large understands the importance of, of, of um, uh, relationships. And, and I will end with this when we talk, talk about the budget. The president's budget is a statement of principles, but it is Congress that funds the government. And Congress has proven time and time again uh, we understand the importance of the, of the, of the foreign budget. You're doing a great job too. I, I, 
Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I got to push back just a little bit on that question. I've been involved in uh, international coalitions oh, for the last 15, 20, uh, 20 years, successful international coalitions. And by and large, if it's big, other countries are not going to come unless the United States is there, the way it is. Number two, when those individuals who are actually working on the ground come together, it is a true coalition. I'm not talking about the politicians, sorry, sir. I'm not talking about the politicians or what's going on between countries because everyone has their own audience that they have to talk to. But down there, where the rubber meets the road, those countries are working together and it is a true partnership. Someone ultimately has to make the decision, but it is a true partnership. So I don't want anyone leaving this room thinking that uh, that is not happening today. Um, we're at great discussion so far. We're getting to the close of our time. I want to give our panelists one last chance to close up remarks and want to think about it back in the framework of what General Mattis said about um, our power of intimidation, our power of inspiration. When it comes to um, America's global leadership, our global engagement, um, what is your, what's the story you have, in addition to the amazing one you had that's seared in your brain about that Afghan girl, about um, the power of inspiration that America has on the, on the global stage? One an additional story for you and a story from Sarah and you, General, about, uh, about what it means. Who wants to start? Not Sarah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> General's going to start. What, uh, as I mentioned, I've been involved in, in a lot of coalitions in places that you all can cross off your list. You don't need to go there. Uh, trust me. Uh, what has inspired me the most is seeing these young, primarily Americans, but actually in these NGOs and PBOs and USAID, they come from all, all countries. These young guys and gals, who could be doing a lot of things, making a lot of money, they are out there in the Somalias of the world, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Timor, you can name them all, really trying to help the people and the people respond to them. And they're doing it for the right reason. I see it again and again, and that to me is inspirational. It gives me a lot of faith yeah. in the young people in this country. Sarah, power of inspiration, you've seen it all. You know, I, I, I think back years and years and years ago when I was, um, I was an exchange student in Italy and um, it was in high school actually. And um, before that I was going to be a doctor. And I got to Italy and I you would spend time just sort of hanging out on the corners with the, the folks and the older generation were, were so enamored of America, the Americans, because the Americans had come and liberated Italy and the Americans had helped that country. And I, I mean, I remember just not even thinking in that sense. You know, I just we don't have a good sense of history in America. We don't grow up thinking about our history and learning from it. And that sense of what our country had done, how we've been able to, the goodwill that remained many, many years later. I mean, I think that's the story that I like to tell about America. And when we see it in the fields, you know, I've gone out to the fields of in the factories in Bangladesh and the factories in Cambodia and the work we're doing to help people really create a new life. That's the story that we want mm -hmm. to continue to tell. And and that's what it is. I mean, I, I agree with some of the, the rhetoric coming out of the, the highest office right now is, is troubling because I, I think Americans are hopeful people. And that's where I'd like to see us get back to, which is we have record unemployment. We're doing pretty well. So where's the hope? And that's where I actually would like to see us. You know, that's what people look to us for is the opportunity and anybody can be president. And you, if you have enough, you can be that person. And I think that's what we tend to translate abroad when we bring that. Um, and so that's where I'd like us to come back to. Congressman closes off, power of our, power of our inspiration. So I landed in New Delhi two weeks after uh, we invaded Iraq. And I hold the record for the CIA officer that has written the most State Department cables um, because I had to do a lot of State Department work. And um, uh, somebody had to show up to the local, the largest mosque in New Delhi on Friday prayers um, to explain the U.S. position on, on Iraq. Mm -hmm. And because I had the most melanin 
in my skin. Um, I, was, I was nominated to go. And uh, to be able to be there and explain where we are, and most of the people there, they still disagree with mm -hmm. our position, but they appreciate it when they came out there. And I tell that story because that's not unique to me. It is what thousands of men and women in our diplomatic corps are doing every single day. And they are, they are promoting our industries, they are promoting our values, and they don't get enough credit, they don't get enough support um, for that. And I've seen my colleagues, I've seen the people that are in the State Department that do that one person at a time, a village at a time, and, and that's what makes me hopeful uh, about the future, despite what you read on television or read above the fold on, on the newspaper, because there's real men and women that care about this country, that care about the world, and are willing to engage and do good. Great way to finish up. Um, my colleague, Jonathan Freddy, is going to come up and close our program. First, I want to take a moment to really uh, round of applause for a great discussion from our panelists right now. Really Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan. Afternoon, I'm Jonathan Freddy, Outreach Director for the State of Texas for USGLC. First, I want to thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you for our advisory committee members, our event partners, and of course, thank you to our esteemed panel. And I think one more round of applause wouldn't hurt. <laughs> Congressman, much as you have uh, uh, borrowed a phrase from Ambassador Crocker, I have often coined a phrase which you related to me in our first meeting together in your office in Washington. I was in the middle of my, my pitch about USGLC, and Congressman stopped me and says, buddy, you're telling Noah about the flood. I know. <laughs> So I can't stress enough how thankful we are for it. your leadership on, on the Hill. Thank you for your leadership in the Texas delegation. And as many of you know, one of my favorite parts of my job is going around the state and hearing about how each and every part of the international affairs budget, Texas, e touches each and every part of the state of Texas. And I want you to look around and think about who's not in this room and who should be, who should be hearing these conversations. And after that, please go out and spread what you've heard here today, what you've learned from this panel, and, and spread the news because a lot of the times the international connection is not so intrinsic for our, our brothers and sisters in the Texas community. Also, I want you to reach out and say thanks to leaders like Congressman, Congressman Hurd and the rest of our Texas delegation and our leaders on the Hill who recognize the importance of these investments of the international affairs budget and why they're a fantastic return for the United States in a myriad of different ways. And if they didn't vote for the budget, ask them why, okay? <laughs> There we go. And lastly, you, have, you all have a uh, placard on your seat for our State Leaders Summit, and it was at that summit where I first got to meet Congressman Hurd. It's our uh, signature event of the year. Several of you in the audience have, have been with us over the years, and, and I would welcome every one of you to join us in Washington June 18th and 19th. Uh, it's a fantastic event, two-day uh, event with a lot of our leaders on the foreign policy space and, and leading thinkers uh, across the nation and across the spectrum of international involvement. Secondly, capped up by a trip to the Hill to, to meet with our leaders on Congress and he really hear your vert voice be heard. So please all think about joining that. Please come see me afterwards. You see how you can be more involved here in the state. And uh, please join me in one more round of applause for our esteemed conference.